Good evening, everybody. It's great to see you and thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm Stephanie Plunkett, Deputy Director and Chief Curator of the Norman Rockwell Museum. And it's a pleasure to have you with us today for the virtual opening event in celebration of Bass Cove, the time we spend with words. In 2017, the Norman Rockwell Museum was fortunate to acquire by generous donation a comprehensive and significant collection of more than 500 original artworks by master printmaker, illustrator, painter, and collagist, Bess Cove. Inspired by the written word throughout her life, she has been a preeminent designer of book jackets that have engaged readers with the writings of many noted authors, including Alice Walker, Robertson Davies, Jerome Sherum, T.C. Boyle, and J.M. Coetzee, among many others. Distinctly expressionistic and beautifully designed, her striking woodcut illustrations have graced the pages of many publications as well, including Red Book, Travel and Leisure, Life, and the New York Times, which published her conceptual imagery regularly on the paper's op-ed pages. As art directed by Stephen Heller, whom we are honored to have with us today. The marriage of text and imagery has been central to some of the most vibrant art of our time, from the work of great 20th century poster artists to persuasive communications that meld modern graphic design and illustration as a means of clarifying and emphasizing ideas and concepts. Throughout her career, Bass Cove has treated words and images as two parts of a visual and conceptual whole, moving far beyond ornament to establish the visual identity of many literary masterpieces. The exhibition that we have just opened features more than 75 original drawings, prints, and paintings, as well as the artist's printing blocks, process materials, and the final published versions of her work. Sincere thanks to Bass Cove and her husband, Michael Avramides, for their generosity and assistance throughout, and to Stephen Heller, a longtime friend of the artist and the museum, who will be leading the conversation. For 33 years, Steve has, uh, was an art director for the New York Times. Currently, he is co-chair of the MFA Designer as Author, de uh, as author Department at the School of Visual Arts. Uh, a program that he also founded. And he has written and contributed hundreds of articles, critical essays and columns for a score of design and culture journals. He is editor at large of printmagazine.com. And uh, he's contributed many insightful um, commentaries for our exhibitions and programs at the Norman Rockwell Museum. His essay titled Bass Cove Shifting Perspectives can be found on the museum's website at nrm.org and it's really a wonderful piece. Please feel free to place your questions and comments in the chat and my colleagues Rich Bradway and Ellen Gorman behind the scenes will bring them forward during the program and we will hope to um, invite Steve and Bass Cove to answer them. So thank you everyone and welcome to Bass Cove and Steve. Thank you. Uh, I first laid eyes on her book covers and jackets around 1973, a year or so after she started illustrating them, having gone to the uh, Philadelphia uh, Institute of Art. Her intense emotion-charged woodcuts, mostly hand-colored, uh, and gothic handcrafted lettering grabbed the eye and stirred the imagination. Her book covers and jackets had an unmistakable aura. They were definitely hers. We met in the mid 70s, introduced by our mutual friend, John Bader, painter. And shortly after I started assigning her work for the Times op-ed page, which Stephanie mentioned. I had a passion for German expressionist woodcuts and still do. Baskov did not mimic them, but she embraced the raw spirit of that style of that time. When I met my wife, Louise Feely, a few years later, I learned that as art director of Pantheon Books, she also worked with and was friends with Basco. That in itself was a great incentive for getting married. In 1986, I did a book called Innovators of American Illustration. There were 21 illustrators in the uh, book. 
and only three women, Suko, Barbara Nessam, and Basco. Uh, we'll start the conversation uh, by looking at the exhibit to begin with. The exhibition is up at the museum, museum I dearly love and treasure, uh, especially in its very uh, wooded, wonderful location. Uh, there's a painting by Norman Rockwell in the background there that has some resonance with Baskov, and she might talk about that later. Uh, the show, as Stephanie said, includes a number of her original works, a number of the wood blocks and process drawings. Uh, so it's a pretty terrific uh, overview of a long career. And it also comes up to the present with her more contemporary work, which we'll talk about at length uh, a little bit later, her collage work, which is uh, like a spinning top in many cases. It unsettles my balance. Uh, they're so motion packed and filled, unlike any collages I've seen. Uh, but let's just start getting a few things out of the way. Baskov was a pioneer. She was uh, a conceptual illustrator, a minimalist illustrator, uh, at a time when the Saturday Evening Post was still the dominant form. Uh, work was becoming more impressionistic, but certainly very realistic, romantic, and sentimental and Basco broke from those traditions. Uh, and in addition to earlier work, including uh, for women's magazines, doing food drawings and perhaps fashion drawings, she was also uh, uh, one of the first to break the, uh, the ceiling, so to speak. Uh, so Basco, what was it like when you started out in 1972 doing book jackets? Well, it was, uh, it was pretty difficult when I was first starting out. You, women weren't given adult literature to do. So I had to work my way up. I did a lot of women's magazine work and I, did, I had to work th by going through educational material. And I did that through college textbooks and gradually I put together a portfolio of uh, literature pieces, literature uh, that was done for college students. And that's how I ended up with uh, a portfolio of um, book covers that were done for literature. You also did medical drawings, right? Oh, when I, yes, when I first got out of school, uh, when I was actually in high school, because several of my uncles were doctors, I, uh, I did drawings for them and I did medical drawings for my uncles when they would devise a new, uh, a new instrument for surgery. So I was perfectly comfortable working in hospitals. And when I got out of college, I worked for the anthropology department at uh, Yale University. Um, and that was, that was absolutely uh, great fun to do much more fun than working for women's magazines. And they would give you a piece of a, a bone of some kind. And through mathematics, you could figure out what the rest of the bone was supposed to look like. And I, I really loved that work, but it was not conceptual in any way. You were really uh, confined to what that particular uh, solution was going to be. So as much as I loved the scientific part of it, it was not really what I wanted to do for the rest of my life, but it's, it's a wonderful profession. And now it's all done by computer. So you put together a portfolio of literary works. You obviously loved literature and read profusely. Uh, how did you break the, uh, the door? You would once told me that uh, your work was dark, which uh, certainly was not a feminine uh, attribute at the time. 
Um, and that some of the art directors that you saw at publishing houses said they'd prefer to give the dark work to men. That's absolutely true. Um, it, it really wasn't a place for women. I don't know how else to say it. The, the men would say, you know, if I have a job, I'd, a man has a family to support and uh, we need to give the job to the men. And it was, it was hard to, um, to get a substantial job in those days for, for women. And I found a few people like Bob Ciano, Rosti Eismont, um, Jackie Meyer, who were, were giving me work on a regular basis. And then I had this portfolio with a few of these adult, I'm sorry, uh, college literature pieces. And um, I kept trying to get into Harcourt because Harcourt was doing the kind of literature that I love. They were doing really classic writers and not bestsellers. And uh, they canceled several appointments on me, but I, I kept trying and I finally got in there and I got in there and they gave me the, um, the art director, uh, Harris Lewine gave me the Amos Oz job right when I got in there. And I think he was surprised at the solution I gave him. And then from, from that point on, we worked regularly and he gave me Alice Walker, he gave me Virginia Woolf and I took off from there. And those covers got a lot of attention and people got used to seeing my style and seeing the kind of work I was doing. And then other people started hiring me. So you think it was as, I wouldn't say as simple, but as uh, magical, let's say, as uh, one art director, Harris Lewine, pressing the button that said it was all right. I think that as an illustrator, you can't do the work unless you're given the job. And once those books started getting out in the bookstores and getting awards, then I started getting a name for myself and people became familiar with what I was doing. That wasn't something I could do unless the work was getting published. And people started writing about it. You wrote about it and it was, um, other people started writing about it. And then other people came to me. I was in Paris when Louise gave me work and other people were sending me work who I'd never even met. And it was terrific. And Christina Skolsky took over after Harris was gone at Harcourt. And I worked with her wherever she was, whether she was at Grove or Weidenfeld. And did, I did some of my best work with her. Jackie Meyer gave me Jerome Sharon's work to do. There were other people that gave me authors that started requesting me as part of their contracts. And I found a place for myself doing literature, which was extraordinary because I loved reading and I, I got some terrific relationships with these authors and it was really an honor. And why was the woodcut your preferred medium? Well, it was a ridiculous way to actually to do an illustration job because it's, it's very time consuming. And to, to do a woodcut and use it one time for an illustration job really didn't make sense. But I loved doing woodcuts. And so that's what I did. And I loved that line. You can't get that line any other way besides carving it out with a knife. Uh, so that's why I did the wood cuts. But over the years, I did more and more linoleum cuts because it didn't take as long. And I did more painting and I worked in other mediums that uh, were not as time consuming because it would take me, uh, it could take me over a week to do a carving like this one. And then once it was printed, it had to be printed with an oil-based ink for me to paint over it. And that would take at least two days just for the ink to dry. 
it was it was quite time consuming. So uh, the book lists come in at the same time and you're working on several books at once. It was uh, juggling a lot of projects at once. It, it could be um, a little tricky. But now that's, that's a medium I really loved. And it's a medium that was really quite powerful, particularly at that time frame in the uh, early to mid 70s. A, a lot of things were changing uh, in terms of art and culture and in general. And uh, the woodcut seemed to be emblematic of those changes. But also there was another uh, issue that you had to deal with. You, you were given work by many authors who worked with black subjects and the industry, the publishing industry had certain, uh, shall we say protocols. Uh, the marketing people didn't think covers with black people on them would sell. Uh, what kind of issues did you have around those? Well, I think having worked with Harcourt, I was very surprised when a book I had done for Jim Coetzee, I caused a lot of problems. I, a, a book called Waiting for the Barbarians. Uh, Coetzee was a, is a South African writer. And the book was about a magistrate who uh, cares for uh, an African woman who's been uh, terribly tormented, tortured actually um, by the administration. And I have put that on the cover and it was banned in the South. And um, so the publisher had a lot of problems with that. And when the next book came up, uh, the Life and Times of Michael Kay, and Michael Kay was a black man, and I went to put him on the cover. They wouldn't let me do that. And that was uh, a real problem for me. And I have to say, it depended on the publishing house. There were no problems ever with Harcourt or Norton or several of the other places I worked with. It really depended on as you said, the uh, press people of certain publishing houses. And it was always difficult for me to deal with that. Uh, when I came up with uh, Coetzee, I was fighting about it. And I also had the Nadine Gordimer account at the time. And they had just killed a job I had done um, on a Nadine Gordimer cover. Who was also South African. Uh, also South African, and I was very upset about it. And it was a book called July's People, July being a black man who's trying to get these people that had hired him, white family, out of a dangerous area. And they didn't want me showing July on the cover. And because I insisted that you couldn't talk about what was in the book without showing July on the cover, they took the account away from me. And I thought they were going to do the same with Code C. And I spoke to a, a friend of mine who was an, an author's agent, uh, someone we had both known, Irene Skolnick. And she told me that it was better for the writers that the books got out onto the shelves than, than what was on the cover, that it was less important what was on the cover than that the books actually got out on the shelves. And so I shouldn't fight with them so much about what I was putting there. And, and your books did get out on the shelves. They were, uh, the as shelves. I remember, they were usually face out rather than spine out. Uh, they seem to attract attention. And uh, so for the Andre Brink, another South African writer, uh, when that came along, this was, I was told this was a different publishing house, but I had a bit of a reputation as a troublemaker. And um, 
they said, we do not want the main character, um, a black woman. We, we don't want any problems. We want this book getting distributed as far and wide as possible. So I, I made her blue and that got through. So um, I tried the best I could to work within this system. And it's amazing to think that this was, this was in the eighties. It wasn't that long ago but it was still a difficult system. And again, it wasn't with every publishing house. I worked for, I worked on the books of so many authors from third world countries, and this did not always happen. And I just was always shocked and furious when it did. And I tried to work through it the best I could. So you had a number of uh, authors that you were quite fond of, like Brink and Coetzee and Alice Walker. Uh, Alice Walker, you did some of her early work. You didn't do The Color Purple. Uh, was that because of the idea of what you were doing was not in the mold of the big book look? I don't know whose decision it was, I think. For the color purple, she had a friend who had done a watercolor that she liked, and she wanted that for the book. And after that book, she became a big name author. And then they, that was taken out of my hands. They wanted a different look for her, her work. So you never really conformed to the uh, dictates of the marketing department. Uh, no, I At least knowingly. I I didn't, and um, and now I think the marketing department has a lot more uh, control over what happens in books than than what was happening when I was working in publishing. So I mentioned the big book look, and it was and still is. Uh, in currency, and it's usually a, a big author's name, uh, larger on the, the scale of size than the title of the book very often. Uh, your manner of doing things was, seemed to me much more intuitive. What worked, worked. And Thomas Mann, The Black Swan is one of those covers that doesn't fit the mold. You did the hand lettering for it. Um, how much of a book did you, a book cover or jacket, did you actually design as opposed to being art director? That book was given to me by Christina Skolsky and she just sent me the manuscript and then I did what I wanted and uh, Mon is one of my favorite authors. I was very grateful to get a chance to work on one of his books. It was uh, an unusual situation. I was in Paris at the time. The book is about a woman who's very ill and um, ironically, a dear friend of mine was very ill. So it was a very meaningful period for me. And uh, I was very, touch to be able to have that to do at that time. You were also given an opportunity, which many book jacket designers do not get, to do front and back, as in Transport 741R. Uh, that must have been a, something of a thrill for you. Oh, absolutely. To have a horizontal piece of work when you usually just get to do vertical pieces. and just to have to, all they wanted was the title and the author's name is just wonderful. You know, you're really freed up and uh, the, I could do the German expressionist kind of type and do something very dramatic on the, the back. And uh, yes, both uh, this piece and Meridian for Alice Walker, I could really have fun with working on the back of the of the cover besides the front have something that goes that would read and surprise whoever picked up the book when they turned it around well 
in doing research for this evening, I really went far and wide and asked Louise, who happened to be sitting next to me, why she gave you uh, jobs in the first place. And her response was, you were one of the few that could actually interpret the work, the, what you read, and indeed read what you read, as opposed to the summaries that often were handed out. I never understood how people could work on a book reading a summary. You didn't get any detail at all. And uh, you, you didn't get the whole arc of the story. I, I never, never could see that. And I, I believe that's what happens for the most part. And I think that I just always had too much respect for the authors to even consider that. In a book like the one we're looking at now, was there any comment from an art director or an editor about the physical appearance of the character? You know, this was done many years ago. It was a young adult book, which was, and it was a very difficult book for a young adult because it was about a young girl that was um, dealing with the Holocaust. So, uh, I don't believe there was very much direction at all. I think they just gave me this to do. Um, and I, I just remember I used a, I usually used a rock maple wood because when, especially when I was doing type so I could get a lot of detail, but I wanted, a, I wanted a heavy grain on this and I think I used mahogany because I wanted to, I, I wanted a much rougher look on this. Using mahogany as opposed to the other uh, rock maple uh, certainly required more strength, I would presume. Mahogany, no, mahogany is not as uh, hard as the rock maple. Uh -huh. It has more of a tendency to splinter, which you could see in the details and the type and it has a heavier grain, um, but, and you have less control. But I think with a subject like this is, is a subject where there is no control in that situation. So I think it's, it's appropriate. I can't pronounce the author's name on the book on the left. Simonon is easy enough. Uh, but this is, to me, one of your uh, m most powerful images. Oh, my God. And here we are again, um, Ukrainians going through just absolute torment. Um, this was one of the first books that I was given by Harcourt and uh, uh, just uh, a horrific story. Sometimes I was given manuscripts that were so heartbreaking that it was, it was really hard to try to figure out what to do about them. Um, but, and not a lot of people would have let me, frankly, uh, do an image like that. But um, uh, Harris Lewine did. So you were the go-to person for heartbreak. <laughs> To some extent, I, su I suppose. <laughs> Here, it seems you're using different media. What caused this shift? And was it uh, experimentation or was it just evolution? Well, the uh, William Goyen is, um, certainly a woodcut done with a very hard wood and probably a rock maple wood because uh, you may have noticed I didn't do uh, a syrup type very often because that's that's pretty hard to do uh, with uh, with wood especially that, that little type with the numbers um, and with Jerome Sharon's work that was those those paintings were done, I guess, towards the end of my uh, book cover period. 
and I was already doing painting by then. And Jackie Meyer, the art director, gave me uh, Jerome's work to do. And I guess she felt I could do sort of a film noir look. And that's what Jerome is known for. And uh, that's just been a delight working with Jerome. And I've done that for a number of years. Have you done all his work? You became friends with him. Yes. No, I, I, I wish I had done all of his work, but we, we did do quite a number of his books. And Robertson Davies is another one of your faves. Can you talk about his work? Yeah, that, that was just a wonderful set of, of coincidences. Um, before I had moved to Paris, I had been doing these little dream paintings. I had painted in gouache for myself and also to do some when I was doing a young adult illustration. And I think even in the book, Free to Be You and Me, the two, two of the children's stories are done in gouache. And um, I was doing research at the Young Institute on dream imagery and I had been going over there for a couple of years and little did I know that at the same time there was this gentleman that was going over there um, from Canada giving lectures and when I moved back from Paris to um, to New York and after spending a couple of years painting dream imagery and reading all of Jung's books, or most of them anyhow, uh, I was given a job to do of Roberts and Davies' work and uh, uh, a well-known Jungian. And boy, did we hit it off. And it turned out we knew the same people at the Jung Institute. And after we had worked together for many years, we found out we both had the same image and Archimbaldo, uh, painting. Um, we both had his um, painting called The Librarian over our desks. I have a three-dimensional di sculpture of that painting. Ooh, okay, well, you see, there are, there are a few of us who um, love that image. And uh, so it was, it was quite wonderful. And I Actually, when I did that type for his book, I wanted to do something in the type that looked like the type was laughing. So um, on the E, I made it look like, like a little bit of a laughing tongue, just, just to put that little, little bit of an edge in there. But it, working with Davies was just a joy. And um, we ended up with a correspondence and he would tell me about the books as he was writing them. And he had three daughters. So I think he was very comfortable writing to me. It, it, was, it was quite wonderful and I do miss him. So the book on the right, The Fugitive, um, you've put a lot of information in this image. Uh, you don't usually do political things, although you did do politics for uh, the progressive, uh, some of your black and white work. But here there's a lot of layers of meaning. Um, what's your feeling about this particular cover? Well, this author actually was considered the Mandela of Indonesia. He spent most of his adult life in prisons. And uh, when Norton gave me this book, I knew they were gonna be making posters from it and that it was very important to them. And um, I wanted to do something that respected his life and the danger he had been in for most of his life and continued to be in at that point when we did the book. I'm just curious, how did that idea of putting his eye in the leaf hit you? 
was it there in your original sketch or did it just stumble into your brain? I honestly don't remember. I always do a lot of sketches beforehand and I don't know how other people work, but I don't really know what I'm thinking beforehand. I find out while I'm drawing. I see it come up on the page. I just start drawing or putting something together and that's when I find out what I'm thinking. And Aaron Applefeld, uh, this has a very quiet yet emotionally striking tone to it. Um, it's a black and white drawing, but it's also a, a very colored, colorful drawing. Um, can you talk a little bit about this? Well, this certainly makes reference to um, the Dybrucka school of um, wood cutting very much. The bridge. The bridge. And um, this was a story about a, a family in Vienna before the Holocaust and how they're dealing with the threats that they're hearing about. This is a, a book that was given to me by um, Christina Skolsky again, and she knew that it would mean a lot to me, and it did. And uh, it's, I think, um, one reason I, and I think you also respond so much to German expressionism is the relationship it has to both personal and societal anxiety in a very, a, a very quiet way. And you, it communicates that, I think, so well. It sure does. So how did, speaking of Germans, how did Jung uh, affect the way you worked, affected the way you lived? I think that the, the funny thing is I had, gone, I, I wanted to give myself some time to learn to paint. And I thought that's what I was going to do. But I ended up um, when I went off, I thought for a year, but I needed more than a year. I went off and I did two things. I, I read Jung and I did worked on dream paintings. And, uh, but then I also did a watercolor diary that was portraits of people I met and um, watercolors of my surroundings, which was uh, the bridges, because I lived by the Seine and landscapes and, and still lives. And then is, when I came back to New York, I found what happened was that I used the Jungian philosophy with Davies and my, the bridges and portraits became my fine artwork. So, so was this a, again, was it an evolutionary shift or was it uh, very conscious that you moved away from book jackets and covers and illustration into another realm? Well, the reason I went off to Paris is I wanted to learn to be a painter and I, I had wanted to do that but I couldn't do it just painting it in the evenings and weekends between jobs. Um, it, you can't do it part-time. So uh, I needed that time to just do it all the time. Although I was doing a few illustration jobs here and there to earn a little money. The money I'd saved was out. And when I got back to New York, then I was sort of had a foot in both worlds. And uh, until I guess it took probably another 10 or 15 years before I could really stop illustration. Totally. I, you, I wanted to be, I wanted to work as a fine artist totally though. 
and you were warned, I gather, not to mention your illustration life. The funny thing is, in Europe, it didn't matter. And my gallery in Paris, they showed, like, I would show there pretty much every year. And one show would be my woodcuts that were Ill book illustrations. You know, they loved literature. So the same people might buy a woodcut of a Chekhov piece and then the next time buy a, a bridge drawing. But in the States, there seems to be a real difference between earning your living in a commercial way and earning your living as a fine artist. That you're much more pigeonholed here. Uh, let's, I was gonna start this conversation off by saying we were gonna do it in three acts. Uh, Milton Glaser had said to me that there are three professional acts that everybody goes through. Doesn't matter what they are, it's just three acts and a lot of scenes within those acts. And your first act was illustration. And this I consider going into your second act. Uh, Even and Basco, do you mind uh, with that with that very thing in mind if we could interject a question from the audience because um, people are very captivated by your symbolism and your use of metaphor. And the question that came through was, um, you know, how do you conceptualize? How do you come up with such unique ways of um, finding images to include and then creating um, such a mix of them that create such a powerful statement. But they're there in the book. For the book covers, they're there. The authors bring them there. I don't, I don't bring those images, the, the authors do. And I think um, that's just my job is to um, reflect what the authors have inside the book. And when you're a fine artist, you decide what's on that page. I don't do that for a book cover. I just try to interpret. I always thought of myself as the dresser in, in the theater, you know, the person that dresses the actor or actress. So they go out and they, they do what they need to do on the stage. That was my job just to, to make them look good so that someone goes into a bookstore and they are pick up that book and they know the journey that they're going to go on. That, that was my job. But the interpreter sometimes changes the words to make them more accessible. And you once said that you did at times uh, insert your own agenda, whatever that may be, into a work, illustration work. I think that there were times, certainly when I was starting out and I was given children's book work to do. And um, I would show children that weren't white and people would say, but it doesn't say this is a story in the ghetto. And I would say, it doesn't say where this story is. It doesn't say what color this kid is. So why can't this kid be a kid of color? And that's, I think, when I would be asserting maybe my own agenda. But um, other than that, I think I tried to stay close to what an author was trying to say. Thank you. When I was working, I would get a call from an art director or sometimes an editor. And they would ask me if I would be interested in a job. And, and if I was, they would send me a manuscript. And um, it, I would read the manuscript and I would start doing sketches. And uh, sometimes after I did the job, I would be contacted by the author, usually through the editor. The editor would say, the author would like to contact you or here's a letter the author sent to me that they would like forwarded to you. But um, 
there wasn't any direct contact from the author to me. It was usually through the publishing company. And um, there were, it was the exception rather than the rule where I became friends with the author. But those authors I did become friends with, I, I really valued uh, those relationships. There were authors like Rick DeMarinas who did have it in his contract that I was to do his covers. And I heard that from his editor because he moved around uh, from one publishing house to another. So I had heard about it secondhand. Um, but mostly I was uh, dealing with the art department or the editors. So act two. Uh, these reading paintings, talk about what they meant to you. Well, I had been doing paintings of dreams, and then I did some paintings of people sleeping. And then, um, because I'm absolutely um, obsessed with books, I realized that the state of reading seemed to me very close to the state of dreaming. That state of intense focus and concentration and being there but not being there and being in this totally other place, uh, I thought I'd start painting people reading and then that's what I did. And I really loved doing it. And so I ended up doing quite a number of these uh, paintings and I got my friends to pose for me. This is, uh, a dear friend, Carol Weston, when we traveled to Paris in, in one of my favorite cafes, uh, we had a great time and, um, and I put uh, little Chardin still lives on the walls um, because as a painter, you can do things like that. You can put things wherever you want. And, um, but it was a, it was a really good way to get uh, models to stay still. And there is something about that state of contemplation, uh, I think that is very intimate and vulnerable and otherworldly. I mean, you can go anywhere and be communicating with anyone. It's, it's magical. It's, it's mysterious. And I think it uses three parts of your brain to be able to read. I, I'm not sure, but I think at least three parts of your brain are needed for that. But also there's something magical about doing a portrait. Uh, you know, s some portraits are very realistic. Some portraits are more impressionistic. Uh, you fall somewhere in between. Um, and the portrait for the viewer is one thing and the portrait for the maker is another thing. Uh, what is the biggest benefit for you emotionally or otherwise about doing a portrait, particularly of someone you know? These are people I adore. There are people who I love looking at, and uh, it's just a great, it's a great pleasure. I've done um, friends, my husband, Michael, has posed for me over the years. He's been on book covers, he's been in paintings, he's been in woodcuts. Uh, he's been very patient. Um, and uh, and I love doing it. I've done several of my friend's children, as you well know, as your dear Nick was also very patient with me and posed for me. And that's also been very special because that little, little bit of that time in childhood just goes so quickly. Uh, and just to capture that moment has, has really been quite wonderful. Uh, it's, it's a lovely thing to do, to, to paint people you care about. 
and there's Michael. Uh, <laughs> and another friend of ours, Katka, who's in blue in the back. This, this was a wonderful experience. I was uh, allowed to go into the reading room of the New York Public Library before it opened. The director let me go in there with my camera and I could photograph the structure, the bookcases, the furniture, the windows, those are great windows before anybody came in. And then I went back at another time when it was full of people just to see how everybody was using the, the, the library and the, the desks were covered with books and papers. And, um, and then I got Michael and Katka and a couple of other people to sit for me. So I had more detail on the figures when I finally did the painting. How precise is the sketch? And then I did a woodcut because the painting could only be sold once. And I wanted, so many people had wanted the painting and, and I uh, was able to do it a woodcut and I did a limited edition with watercolor of the, of the woodcut. And you can see what happens with a different line and of course it's, it's flatter and there's a translucence from the, the watercolor, um, but there's still the structure of the room and uh, you can see how the shading happens from the lines in the woodcut. Uh, it's, it's different in feeling, but there's still all the figures there, the people working there, the people reading all the books. And then you went to Bridges. Well, Maybe I, not in that order, but the bridge is something very important to you. And for me as a, a viewer, uh, there's a monumentality, but there's also uh, a sense of fantasy, a surreal quality to these. Why bridges? Um, I, this is my, this is the bridge that's closest to us. So this is the Queensboro. Um, and it's the one that I go to most often. It, it has that funny little uh, kink in the middle. It's, it, it doesn't, it doesn't have that smooth, those, those smooth curves that a lot of the other bridges have. Um, I just have this sense of exhilaration when I'm going over bridges and when I see them. Uh, there's actually, I, I wrote it down, uh, J.R. Mulwinder, which people I think are even more familiar with now because of, um, they, they did a, a film of, of his book, The Tender Bar. Uh, he, he wrote this about this, this place where he grew up, grew up with, there was a bar full of men who became his extended family. And uh, he wrote, um, everyone has a holy place where their heart is pure, their mind clearer, where they feel closer to God or love or truth or whatever they happen to worship. And that's how I feel about bridges. Um, this is the, the Bronx White Stone and the cables coming out from either side. To me, they're just like arms opening up to embrace you when you're crossing over that bridge. And the Brooklyn. The Brooklyn Bridge had intimidated me for so many years. It was really hard for me to uh, confront painting that bridge. And uh, I studied it and I avoided it. I did so many other bridges before I did that one. And then uh, I finally embraced it. And, and now like the other bridges, I feel like they're a part of me and I'm, I'm part of them. And, and uh, I'm just so grateful to be in that world. And this feels like it's uh, an entry into paradise. 
does it it's the central park bridge it's the southwest reservoir bridge um and going into central park does feel like paradise for a lot of people it's i think it can be otherworldly that's one thing about bridges you're in a space that is not in the place you're coming from or the place you're going to it's a totally separate place you're hovering over water or a road or air you're in a place that's a place all itself and this one looks like a celebration as well you've added your own flourish to the uh steel and metal work uh, to the otherwise sometimes invisible qualities of the bridge. I think they just feel so alive to me that I hope I can communicate that to others. So this is act three. Uh, Tell us why you started doing collage. Well, I always photograph a lot for my bridges, uh, hun sometimes a hundred photographs from all different views and different times of day. And uh, it got to a point I had a health problem and I was having trouble painting and uh, I, took those photographs and started cutting them up and putting them together in different ways and started really enjoying the spaces that came out of that. And uh, these almost become photo montages to some extent. I also photograph skies so I can use those skies in my paintings because the sky changes so fast. So I have a, a whole, uh, I have boxes of photographs of skies that I've taken and boxes um, listed for a lot of different bridges. And um, so I cut them up and I put them together and I make spaces and I try to make them uh, feel as exhilarated as I feel looking at them. Is doing a collage psychically different for you? Does it trigger something else than a painting? Well, when I'm doing a painting, I'm trying to make it look like the bridge to somebody else. I want there to be a roadway and I want there to be one side of a bridge and the other side of the bridge. When I'm doing a collage or mixed media or photo montage, I don't care. <laughs> I, what I want is I want a sense of movement and something exciting and I want, I want it to explode. That's what I want. I want movement. I want a sense of something going off like a firework and, and that's what's most important to me about that happening. Stephen Vasco, we have um, a question about the bridges, and I wonder if I could just insert that. <clears throat> um, uh, one of our, our listeners is fascinated by your treatment of water in your bridge paintings and um, wonders if you might comment on how you think about water and, um, and how you're interpreting it for these artworks. I just want a lot of movement. And so I suppose that's how I do the water also. And in this, well, certainly in this painting, the water mirrors the sky a bit. It, it sort of um, has a bit of the same movement that those clouds have. You, you sort of build up from the water to the sky and it just, uh, those half circles become larger and larger. So it builds up a certain rhythm, I think, or that's what I tried to do. And the bridge itself is so stationary. It is, but again, there's a rhythm with that too. Um, both the, the cables, the curve of the cables sort of reflect what's happening in the sky. And um, 
the there is that solidity um, from the from the bridge. Here, the water is again reflecting the sky, which is what it does. So speaking of explosions, this seems like a universe that's uh, closing in on itself. Yes, that was um, the outer, bra outer bridge, um, bridge crossing. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a funny little bridge. And again, I just photographed it under it and over it. And um, Michael held me up because I was in a, a field underneath it at one point, standing on a, trying to stand on a lot of rubble. My balance is lousy. And I had to stand on a lot of rubble to get those underneath shots. And, um, but we did that and, you know, we did it. And I asked him to keep driving back and forth, which he did. Then I was found from the library, these wonderful old photographs of when it was first built. And I put those in there. And um, it, it's a lot of fun. I mean, it's, it's really a lot of fun to just go, yeah, let's put this here and let's put this there and let's make this happen and that happen and not go, well, this is the middle and this is the left and this is the right, you know? And then put a cup of coffee right in the middle. And this one, suggests the uh, uh, the bridge with the cables as arms, except more on steroids than uh, the painting. This was so much fun to do. Um, this is the GWB, which I've done a couple of times. This was my last, uh, this was just finished recently. And it, I think there were, I can't count them now, but it, it was taken from so many different shootings uh, over the years. And, and then I just, uh, I used some of them as background shots. And then I just kept printing and printing more out and just cutting the cables out and um, putting them on. And just, ex I just wanted it to explode from the center to see what would happen. And, um, and I hope I did it. And uh, I put them on pieces of black gouache in the background. And um, yeah, it was really a lot of fun. And one even from uh, seeing, the, seeing the GWB from a window, I think about the middle, in the middle on the upper one that I'd used from a, a really old shot. So yeah, it's, it's, going back to when you're really young and you're just playing with things like it doesn't have to go anywhere it's not it's not a job for anyone it's not it doesn't have to be anything it can just go wherever it wants to go so i often when i am working on something and i feel i've got a momentum i can't go to sleep at night because I'd much rather work, or at least I want to go to sleep quickly so I could wake up early. How excited do you get by these? Do these have to be finished in a certain amount of time to use up your energy? Or can it, do you let it linger so that you can enjoy more time with them? These take a long time to do. This probably took me about three months. So it's not like I can just stay up all night and do it. it these, all these pieces have to be printed and I may um, change the pieces. I tape them down, I pin them down, I change them, I hold them up, I turn the piece upside down, I change whole sections. So, uh, it really is very time consuming. And then I'll get, I'll, I'll, I'll be thinking about it. I'll make notes, I'll do all kinds of things. So um, I work on them for a very long time. The, the, the funny thing is they take as long as the paintings did and they've ended up about the same size. 
I guess that's the right size for me to be working. Best Coke, there was a question from the audience about what the scale of these artworks are. Would you want to mention that? Well, let's see, the one we're looking at now, I believe is about 42 inches square. This one, which is the time we spend with words. And um, the one we're looking at now uh, actually just started with the idea of two things. I don't know how easy it is to see, but there are these little black half circles in there, and those are thumb indexes from dictionaries and thesauruses, which I am nuts for. So I had gone to Argosy to get some dictionaries and nobody seems to want to buy them anymore. And so they let me carry out as much as I could hold. And um, I came back and, and uh, I photographed the, the center and the bottom are photographs of the edges of those dictionaries and the, the sources, which I kept photographing and then cutting up and making uh, smaller and smaller images till I could sort of make a spiral. And then I did that on the bottom too. And, um, and then I started using the dictionary pages. So there's spiraling out from that. I also printed out some of I know it's hard to see at that scale. Some of my favorite book pages, um, there's a page from Emily Dickinson and um, Little Women, which is the book I learned to read from when I was four years old, which my mother taught me to read from that book. So that was always uh, in, ingrained as an amazing experience for me. And um, there's Virginia Woolf's, the constant reader. Uh, there, are, there are pages from several favorite authors uh, floating around that, that background. And then there are words that just have to do with reading uh, pages and alphabet and dictionary, thesaurus type, uh, which I cut up from words. In fact, I asked Louise Feely if I could use some of her typography, which she said she didn't mind. And so there's a lot of Louise's type in there. And it was so much fun. And then I was reading a book of Kaczynski's um, on paper. And he was talking about uh, information, how we share information, and how all of these scrolls and books and and the, what it, the printing press did and and uh, it was just an amazing wonderful book and then how we now put everything on microchips so you don't need all those books and and encyclopedias and so on so I put a couple of microchips in also but it was great fun to work on it again took months to do that and um it's and kind of a self-portrait <laughs> i guess most artists work are self-portraits this is called emily war white and it was uh done after i read one of jerome sharon's books actually he wrote two books about emily dickinson and um and he was just talking about Dickinson as a warrior. This is her poem, The Spider Sewed at Night. And she would write her poetry at night. And uh, she talks about the spider weaving its web at night. And she identified with that. And I thought about the women in my family, how they sewed. And she talks about um, women of her time sewing from uh, the time of childhood to the time of, um, of shrouds. From, she talks from rough to shroud. And um, for the, the lifetime of each member of the family. And it was, uh, it's, a, it's a very 
It's a short poem. There are only these nine lines. There's each of those black stripes is one line of the poem. It's three stanzas. And I wanted to turn that into a piece of art besides her piece of art. She wore white at the end of her life. So it started out basically with uh, there's uh, a strip that's just little pieces of, of white, the little pieces of different colors of white and, and a spiral. And that's how it started out. And then I saw this piece of, um, I guess it's crochet at, at my friend's studio, uh, Laura Rosen's studio, and she gave that to me very generously. And that became the, uh, the, the center or the, the end of that spiral. And it sort of grew from there. And um, I used my mother's buttons and needles. They, they became part of it. And a, a lace collar I had found in Paris and it, it got a life of its own. So in one sense, it's uh, a narrative of someone else. And in another sense, it's a memory box of your own. I think that's what all of these pieces are. And when you, when you start it, you think you're doing one thing and then over that period of time, and that's, I think because these pieces are done over months at a time, memories do come up and other pieces are found that you bring into it. So uh, it does become very complex and it, it grows, it becomes its own story that you don't, you don't realize when you start it where it's going to go. And, and in a way, that's what I enjoy so much about them. So have these replaced painting for you? Will there be any other paintings or drawings? I, I don't know. I keep thinking there might be. I, I keep my brushes and my paints. But when I think of a new piece, I find that this is what I'm going towards. So I don't know. Well, I, I thank you both for an amazing and insightful conversation. So interesting. And the work is just extraordinary. Um, I'd be nice to close with a, uh, a question from Jerome Sharon, who uh, actually came forward and asked uh, and said, I consider your jackets um, or the jackets that Bass Cove has done for my books as works of art that don't illustrate the text, but that provide a kind of song for them. What does Bass Cove feel? How do you think about them? I think that's lovely and I feel really honored, Jerome. Thank you. And I guess I'd like to just thank you most sincerely for the incredible donation of your work to the Norman Rockwell Museum. Um, it is so meaningful for us to have it and we're so honored to display it. And I wondered um, if you might say a little bit about your decision to um, work with the museum on such an incredible gift, because I know it was a big decision. Well, I, I think, um, as I had mentioned to you, my, um, my history with Norman Rockwell's art um, developed over time. And as that piece of work we saw in the, the opening shot that the problem we all live with uh, had really um, been very meaningful for me. And I had not, I had not related to his work until I had seen that piece. And I was pretty young when I saw that piece. But before then, I thought of his work as uh, representing a, a life that I didn't never had seen around where I was living, which was inner city. And, uh, you know, people were all very nice to each other. And, you know, it was a very easy, very safe uh, community. And, and um, when I saw that, I really uh, was 
surprised. It wasn't what I was used to from, from seeing in uh, his work. And then I was, uh, then I really started paying attention. And I was very grateful to him because people trusted him and had confidence in what he was saying. And I think he had an audience that would listen to him that wouldn't have listened to someone else and he could talk to them in a way others couldn't. So I think he really did a great service to the country in coming and showing his uh, work and talking to them in a way that only they could hear from someone like him who they had grown to trust over those years. Thank you for that. And for an incredible program, Steve, thank you for your um, interesting questions that brought out such great discussion. And Best Cove, thank you again for all of your um, incredible creativity and the work that uh, we so look forward to having on view through June 5th. Um, the originals are extraordinary, and we hope that many of you can come to view them. Um, if you'd like to see uh, more, of Best Cove, we have a terrific video online uh, at nrm.org created by Rich Bradway and um, Ellen Gorman. And uh, please go to our website to see what else is coming up. But in the meantime, we thank you again for an exceptional evening and, um, and a great show. Thank you all for joining us and we will see you again soon.